GIB, we've been doing some work with the DEC Hindu team about um, what's happening in heat networks and how to finance these. We've been involved in a, an investor day to um, hopefully try to make it uh, uh, attractive for long-term uh, funders in these things, and we've um, very shortly got a paper that um, DEC are going to put out to all local authorities about how to finance these things and some things to think about. So I'm going to try to summarize that. There's some detail in the slides. I won't necessarily go into all of the detail, but uh, if the slides are available um, afterwards, um, then you can pick it up there. So just a quick sort of uh, recap on GIB, who we are, what we have been doing. Um, so Green Investment Bank, we've just celebrated our third anniversary. 100% owned by the government for just now. Um, we were endowed with £3.8 billion pounds worth uh, of capital to invest, the rationale being there's a shortage of investment in the green sector. So we've tried to mobilise um, other third-party funding coming into the green sector. Similar to the Carbon Trust, the mission we've got is to accelerate low-carbon investment going into the UK market. We're now virtually fully staffed. We've got some like um, 70 specialised uh, people who look at... Um, uh, low carbon and the green sector and in total some like 120 people in the GIB between both the London and uh, the office up in Scotland. Um, the mission we've got is to make some money for the taxpayer so that's good. Um, our current uh, IRR just to throw that in there is um, roughly over 10 so you know the return which we're making for the, for the taxpayer is a reasonable sum. The mission is to be both green and profitable so everything we do has to have a low carbon impact to it, whether it's um, waste from landfill or CO2 savings. And as part of that, what we aim to do, as I say, is to crowd in um, other funding from the private sector, so to show other banks, other funders, how we're doing it. We have a specialist team also uh, of people who look at the green side, so it's not just full of horrible bankers, there's people who specialize in the environment and also um, in uh, low carbon. The markets we um, currently look at offshore wind, waste and bio uh, energy, energy uh, efficiency, and onshore wind and small scale hydros. The EE side is the one that's important here. It um, basically looks at lots of things, which include uh, on the public and the private sector side, uh, district heating, um, LED street lighting, CHP, building retrofit. And building retrofit is also quite an important one, which can go hand in hand with the district heating. Um, and that can be both um, with local authorities, with housing associations, with the uh, NHS. So how are we doing? So we've currently uh, put out £2.3 billion pounds worth of capital invested in 58 um, individual deals. And in doing that, I've mobilised, we reckon, £10 billion pounds worth of capital from the private sector. Quite a lot of that's gone in offshore winds. So we've done eight offshore wind deals to date, which has taken £1.3 billion. Pounds. We've set up eight small scale funds, so it's not just big, big deals we do. Some of the funds that we've got invest in anything from roughly half a million pounds upwards, which could be you know, important if you're doing small scale CHP or retrofit. And we have done deals in the public sector, so we've done LED street lighting um, uh, in the NHS. We've now financed four deals there looking at small scale district heating and uh, retrofit. An important thing in doing that as well is we've taken um, something like, we reckon, uh, two million cars off the road with the CO2 savings and um, there's enough uh, uh, energy saved to power four million homes. Other important things we look at um, and which the government actually monitor on is in doing this, the number of jobs which we've actually created in the low carbon sector. So we reckon that you know there's a growing theme of the jobs there. So we actually reckon that investments that we've uh, put out employ something like three and a half thousand people. And the £510 uh, million pounds we put into funds has gone into quite a lot of uh, SMEs. And you can see on the map, um, a lot of investment in the south of England. We're starting to get um, basically more up in Scotland, and that will happen over time. And it's not just the financing we do. I mean, like the Carbon Trust, what we try to do is when we've done something that's good, we, you know, we actually like to publish it. So over the last three years, there's a number uh, of reports we've uh, put out both in the waste sector, in the NHS, sec NHS sector, um, LED lighting, and earlier this year we put something out in response to smart cities, but we are calling them uh, low carbon cities because we believe you can do both at the same time. So rather than wait for the panacea of the smart city, 
you can start to do it by thinking about um, LED street lighting. Can you use that to create a network, etc.? The financing, um, and this is probably important when we come to look at district heating. So, our, from the GIB's point of view, our financing is very flexible. It can be very long dated, so it can be like a pension fund, which is important for the district heating market. It can be on balance sheet or off balance sheet, and that can be important if you're looking at between a local authority or perhaps a central government. Central government tend to want to have structures that don't sit on the balance sheet, so we can do that. So, and that can be in the form of equity or debt. Let me just zip through a couple of slides here. So, um, heat networks, through the work we've done with Hindu, we are starting to see the projects come through. And I know they've looked at something like 80 to 90 business ca cases um, over the last um, 12 to 18 months. We reckon that the sector currently, at the very low level, has the opportunity to invest 500 million pounds to 2020. You know, so we've not seen a huge amount of, um, of investment to this point in time. We reckon baseline level is about 500 million to 2020. So that's roughly 100 million pounds a year, which doesn't sound a lot, but it's a lot of work. So why would people be interested in, in this? Well, once you build it out, and we can see on the chart here, you can start off with an anchor load, which is in the red, which might be for the local authority, for you know, um, libraries or schools, and you can start to develop that over time. But what you're getting something here is that an investment which is long term, once it's built, it is relatively stable, and the technology is not a huge leap of faith. So it's the sort of thing that should basically attract uh, uh, pension funds over the long term. So whilst we've heard that you, know, you can change the fuel sources, whether it's starting off with gas, could evolve to CHP, um, could evolve into uh, uh, biomass, other things over time, the pipe network itself can be in the ground for 40, 50, 60 years. So that's something which, when it is built up, can appeal to pension funds. What we believe is going to happen is that over time, as the investors look at this, you will have a new asset class. So similar to what you've seen in the utility sector just now, where people come in, pension funds are buying over uh, power stations and the generation of uh, assets. We, we believe that over time, it might not happen in 2020, pension funds and long-term investors will start to look at this very seriously. And of course, in doing this, we are starting to see the evolution of the market. You've, you've, you've heard of the concept uh, green bonds. So pension funds are starting to allocate certain parts of their portfolio into green investments, and we're helping them with that. So this is something that should play into that um, over time. So if you're a local authority and you're embarking on this, what can you do to attract an investor? Well, you need to take them along the journey. So, you know, and this is what actually Hindus are, are, are trying to get, are, are trying to work with the local authorities to do, to work the scheme up, to get the information out there and to share that at the earliest possible point so that, you know, you're bringing them along, they understand the investment is going to come. When I speak to some of the private sector companies that are looking at um, investments here or in the lighting sector, they talk about actually spinning a lot of plates. So they reckon there's 100 or so deals out there, but they don't know which one's going to come first. The problem is it's the signaling. So they don't have a clear story about where the investment is, how it's go going to happen. So what literally the project team need to do is start to do the business case, share elements of that with the market, and Hindu have been very good at doing that, and start to build the confidence that the project will happen and happen in a certain time. Um, one of the key things which we see as well here is an understanding from an early stage of what you're trying to do. So what is the risk which you want to keep in the local authority and what are you looking to transfer over to the private sector? And the concept earlier on of the anchor load is actually really important and that's how you can actually build up uh, basically the project over time. So start off with the anchor load. Let's start to look at where you want to cite those risks. So who's going to be basically responsible for the development risk, for the construction risk, when it goes into operations, who's responsible there? And it starts to work out where that sits. So does it sit within the local authority? Do they have the team, do the experience to manage it themselves? Or do you scope it out and start to bring, you know, some of the experts and the Cofellis and pe people like that? Um, but what we do advise at the early stage is to use other local authorities that have uh, experience of doing that, or sets of advisors, so the Carbon Trust or firms of accounting, et cetera, who've done this in the past 
it seems like you're having to spend money, but it does save in the long term. And they ought to know about what are the features which are basically attractive um, for the funders. So, you know, are you going down a structure which is going to be financed through the authorities on cash, or are you starting to look at, you know, bringing banks or, um, or for example, the pension funds? Um, you won't be able to read too much in this slide, but this is one of the things that we've talked um, Hindu through, and it's going through from basically the development stage to the commercialization onto the delivery of this, and looking at where the funding can come at different stages there. So at the development stage, you'll probably find that the private sector market are not there to invest in it. This is something where um, if Hindu have some central financing, if the local authority can actually um, use some of the resources themselves. And I think in the heat networks market, the benefit of having Hindu there is they do have a central team, and I know they've actually funded some of the business cases. In other parts of the low carbon sector, we've not seen that, and they are actually um, struggling. And things like, for example, the street lighting, where we, we would expect, because of the savings there, every local authority to be doing that, there's a challenge in terms of the resources and the cost of actually working up the business case. So good support from Hindu. What should be going at that? You know, what should be happening at that stage? It should be the financial modelling, and it should be uh, analysing the risk. Once you get into the commercialisation, and that's what we're seeing with some of the first of the projects to come through Hindu now, you're starting to speak to the market. You're starting to speak to the banks, the pension funds, getting the, their views. but starting to think about what is the structure and how are you going to fund it? What's the documentation which you need to let them see? And then obviously, once you get into the delivery stage, you can then start to finance that. So is the local authority going to invest in the scheme and to bring uh, some of the returns out of that? Is it going to pass it over to uh, um, ESCO? You know, so we've all heard about um, energy service companies. Now, ESCOs ought to be able to bring their own source of financing in. But of course, the balance there is, from an authority point of view, you might not have so much of the control, but you may not also get some of the returns that come out of that. So local authorities should be thinking about, can they invest in that? So, Yes, you can go down the ESCO route, but do you want to have a share in that? Do you want to sit on the board of the company? And you can start to bring um, uh, equity in. If the project's set it right, you can actually bring uh, uh, debt into that um, also. And over time, if we look to, um, at the far right, we believe we'll start to see the evolution of the market go into the secondary market. So probably not now, but five years' time, seven years' time, ten years' time, we'll start to see aggregation of some of this where pension funds are coming in and they're starting to buy some of these assets in the secondary market. So, three slides to go, if that's okay for time. The considerations, and I, I can't stress enough, is thinking about the risk and the reward here. An example would be, if the project is low risk, and we, um, from the GIV's point of view, we do this in the street lighting market, if it's low risk, the authority can actually take on a lot of the work, a lot of the risks themselves, and actually finance it themselves, either through something like their own cash, through the Public Works Loan Board, or in the GIB's case, we actually have, uh, have a product which we lend into the authority, and, uh, and it's at a very cheap rate, and it's like a pension fund type of loan, but it, it's long dated, but it's not something that's going into the private sector, it's a loan going to authority, but that sits well with the type of risk. However, if you're doing a district, uh, district heating scheme, you may not have all the expertise in how to do that, you know, and you may want to bring the private sector in, so you need to start to think about how to fund that, or at least how to set up the risk matrix, you know, so what, what are you going to do yourselves, how, you know, how are you going to manage the, uh, those risks here? So some of the things to look at, and, you know, if you're doing a spreadsheet, some of this actually may go in there, things like um, uh, on the um, income side, what are the anchor loads, what is the income that's coming from that? What is the payment mechanism that goes with that? So how are you looking to index that over time? Is it RPI, is it CPI, is it basically a blend of that? And also from a banking point of view, if I'm actually lending into this, I'm looking at the risk of the counterparties. So is the, basically the client that's paying for the heat, is that a local authority? Or are you looking to uh, pass that over to you know, um, housing associations? Housing associations are relatively safe, but probably not as rated well as local authorities. So the cost of debt, the cost of financing will be higher at that point. Similarly, on the expenditure side, very interested in the capital costs, your maintenance costs, your life cycle costs. What is the phasing here? So how long do you need the financing to be open for us so you can draw that down? Are you going to draw it down over one year, two years, five years? As you go further out, there's a bit more risk for me as a funder. And also because of the shape 
of the, of the um, uh, uh, effect of the cost of financing um, of the curve of that, which goes like that, the longer out you go, it'll cost more. And from the finance point of view, I, you know, I will be looking at um, the financial model to see the rates of return, to see the NPVs. Not the be all and end all, but it helps me benchmark between different schemes. If I have a scarce amount of capital, I will look at that. I'll look at other things as well, but I will actually look at that. Very quickly on this slide. So this is one of the things that's going out in the pack to the local authorities with Hindus, where we're starting to look now at some of the types of information that will go into the contract. So um, anchor heat, how's that coming in? Have you documented it? Do you have a heat supply agreement? In the future, how's that going to work? What is the documentation that's going to be in place for that? If you're generating uh, e electricity, do you have a, a PPA in place? Is that for five years? Is it for 10 years or 15 years? The longer it is, gives me, uh, as a funder, greater certainty. And similarly, as we go down the list there, it's all about the documentation and how I, as a funder, can do, uh, do, do diligence that, if I can say it properly. I don't expect it to be in place at the outset when you're doing your business case, but as you go down the path of developing the project, you do need to think about that because actually when funders come to look at this, they need to see the, um, all the docs. So when we then look at this, the structures you can have, you can have a corporate finance type of facility. So up at the top left, you'll see there where the local authority or the housing association and may simply want to own the scheme themselves, in which case, you know, you will be the counterparty, the authority will be the counterparty for the documentation, and there can be a whole raft of documents there. Similarly, underneath that, you may want to go down the project finance route, so that's where you can have the energy service uh, company, which you may or may not want to invest in. And at that point there, you may be asking the private sector to bring their funding into the project. It will come at a higher cost of capital, most likely, but you're putting the risk onto them for a number of things. So options around that. So the simplest one, which was seen um, in uh, some uh, uh, local authority projects so far, particularly on building retrofit and heating, uh, so heating um, street lighting, is for the authority to use their own cash. So there's a number of local authorities just now are sitting on cash in bank accounts earning half a percent. So it makes sense. Um, on projects that are small scale, sometimes to use your own cash. You obviously have the option to go to government for grants, for Salix funding. Salix funding, very, very helpful in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, what it costs. Um, one of the things about Salix funding is how you then blend your funding around that. Salix typically will have a, a payback on it of five to eight years. It's interest free though, so it's very helpful, very helpful to start things off, but the key is how you blend long-term funding around that. And as you go further down the route, corporate finance. So corporate finance, borrowing from the Public Works Loan Board, or in the case of GIB or some other banks, you know, that are starting to do this. Can you have a product there that's very long dated that you can actually shape? Can you shape it to the savings which you're going to actually make from the project here? And finally, there on the project finance route, um, uh, equity and debt, higher cost of capital, but that's uh, typically the way that the private sector will look to structure some of the projects. So in summary, what I'd say is the projects through Hindu, through what we're seeing in the market, are starting to come through. Um, for the GIB, the good thing about them is they offer the benefit of low carbon and also you know, the social uh, benefits there. So very often what's not looked at and what, what has an impact upon the business case is what you're going to charge for the heat and the power that, that, that uh, uh, comes off there. But that's why it's also important have the baseline because you need to know that if you don't do the project what is it going to cost otherwise and finally what I'd say is the financing is available it's available through corporate finance or project finance um, or whatever route you take to choose the key is at an early stage to understand the profile of risk that goes with the project and start to match what is the best type of funding for that over the long term and it might not be the funding that sits there always it might be something which you do on an equity basis for example to get um, for example, the project going, and then you refinance that later on. Thank you very much.